so good afternoon good morning good evening um good to see you all and um yeah well let's um start with some of the uh the housekeeping and uh, allow people to join as we get going um my name's Jim Robinson. I'm the HLP AOR, Housing, Land and Property Area Responsibility Coordinator with the Protection Cluster. And um, yeah, really good to have you here at our uh, quarter two sort of global meeting where we get to you know, hear around something around a specific subject, but then also hear updates from uh, some of the coordination related to HLP, but also from yourselves and, and the work you're involved in. So um, really good to, to have you here and um, we'll be recording the session as you probably heard when you joined uh, and um, that will allow others to access uh, in the future. Um, but yes, nice to see you, a few of you putting your cameras on. If you're able to put your cameras on and just say hello, then feel free to um, do that and then maybe say goodbye again if you need to hide away. Um, and uh, yeah, good to, oh, look at this. There's loads of people I hadn't realized. Um, nice. And um, so today we've got sort of three kind of main areas really. We've got um, a specific uh, discussion looking at HLP, transitional justice and Ukraine. So um, yeah, a broader conversation on some of those uh, issues around transitional justice and, and compensation, but sort of situated very much in the context of, of what's happening in Ukraine and thinking about the response to that situation in terms of housing, land and property. Um, so that'll involve a couple of uh, presentations and then some good time for discussion. Um, and worth saying at this point, and I'll say it again, but this is the, the start of a process for this. We want to create a bit more of a dedicated um, group to, to look at some of these issues. So this is a sort of a, a trailer, if you like, a, a discussion to get us into it and then uh, uh, develop further. And then we'll move to a couple of updates. We've got Shelter Cluster HLP. Um, Specialist Ibire is going to give us an update from, from uh, some of the work they've been doing there. And then I'll give an update from the um, global AOR side. And that will also include, include a colleague speaking a little bit about uh, climate change and HLP as well. And then we have what I think is my often my favorite bit, um, where we get to hear from all of you and you can uh, share what you're doing, what you're involved with, um, what's going on and some of the, the challenges, some of the things that are happening uh, for you. And uh, it's quite interesting then to hear what others are working on. Sometimes there's clear areas where uh, a connection can uh, enable you to yeah, develop something you know, better and more effective. So all sorts of good opportunities for, for learning from each other. And that's, that's you know, the purpose of this, this, this group really. So um, yeah, well, so let's, I think we'll move first to um, to focus on on transitional justice, HLP in Ukraine, and really pleased to have uh, uh, Vladimir join us from uh, the HLP Technical Working Group in Ukraine with NRC, and also uh, John Unruh as well. And they've been working with some other colleagues on um, well, obviously various things to do with um, Ukraine and HLP. Um, and we're going to start with Vladimir. Hello, good to see you, and. Uh, you're going to give us a bit of a, an update on the context, what's happening there, and how that relates to some of these questions around HLP. Over uh, to you, Vladimir. Good afternoon, Jim. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, I'm really glad to have this opportunity to present a little bit about what we are now on the compensation file in Ukraine. Uh, just some technical notes. I hope you can hear me well and you can see me well. Otherwise, just let me know in the chat. So as we have a quite heavy agenda for today, I wouldn't spend much of your time on some introduction part. Just want to say that my name is Volodymyr Horbaladze. I work with NRC and also I'm coordinate HLP technical working group in Ukraine which sits under the protection and shelter trust. And during the last few years, one of the main focus of our work and our advocacy is uh, compensation, access to the compensation and restitution mechanism for Ukrainian Ukrainians who are affected by the first law the conflict in Donbas area and currently for the whole Ukraine. So at this very moment, I would like to start sharing my screen. Um, I hope you can see the presentation. Yes, we see it well. Um, so actually in the photograph, there is a multi-storied housing in Borodyanka. You might hear about the city, which is one of the most affected city in the 
in the Kyiv region. So uh, I would like to start with a brief explanation of the background, where we are now, what we have in place, uh, some of the aspects which I grouped in three different groups like positive aspects, neutral one, and the negative or challenges which we have to address in order to be able to provide compensation and restitution to the conflict affected people. So first of all, as you may know, the, 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 the new phase of the conflict has started on the February 21st after the invasion of uh, Russian military forces on the territory of Ukraine. And uh, since that day, the, the situation and the context background in Ukraine has been significantly changed comparing to what we have during the last eight years. So uh, at the very beginning, you, uh, I would like to say what we have now on the positive aspects uh, on the current compensation file in Ukraine. The first thing, and this is extremely important, that at this moment we have really, really strong political will to establish the compensation mechanism, the compensation framework for conflict affected people. And actually it makes our work a little bit easier because the president of Ukraine has been stated that every conflict affected people, every conflict affected person with the damaged or destroyed housing will be restored in their rights. However, and the only thing that, of course, some mechanism should be developed and, and implemented by the responsible uh, stakeholders. And we already have the direct order from the president of Ukraine to the cabinet of ministers to intensify the work in this direction. So the, the, the second one is actually quite related to the first one that we already have the ongoing legislative initiative. Uh, I will uh, explain it a little bit more in details in the next slides. Just want to say that at this moment, we already have the compensation draft law uh, successfully registered in the Ukrainian parliament and successfully passed the first hearing in the Ukrainian parliament. However, uh, the legislative process requires three hearings until the adoption. So two more steps is still required to make this draft law as a law. Uh, the last, the, the third one is uh, that Ukrainian government already has some positive um, experience of the previous implementation of the compensation mechanism in Ukraine. Because as you may already know, uh, two years ago, Ukrainian government has adopted the compensation mechanism for destroyed housing in Donetsk and Luhansk Oblast. And they have been implementing this mechanism for two last years and hundreds of beneficiaries receive compensation for completely destroyed housing. So we already have some strong lesson learned from this from, from these mechanisms and how it was implemented, what should be amended in order to enable as much people as possible to uh, access uh, this, uh, this compensation mechanism. And uh, the last one, during the last, during the, the first, the first four months of the conflict, we already have some legal documents partially covering the compensation mechanism. It's of course, it's not established, establishing the compensation mechanism itself. However, we already have the adopted on the level of the cabinet of ministers, the methodology on the damage assessment. And uh, to be quite honest with you, uh, personally, me, I think that this mechanism, it might work because they even, even foresee different procedures, for example, for light, uh, light damages, for small damages, and also uh, completely different procedures for completely destroyed housing and assessing the scope of the damage. Uh, moving forward to the, to the some neutral aspects, we just have to consider during our work, which we cannot put in the positive on the negative. This is just the fact we have to work with. The first thing that the president of Ukraine have been state, has stated that the primary focus of, the, um, uh, of this work is going to be on the restitution uh, of property. I mean, not restitution of rights, but restitution of property or reconstruction. The primary aim to reconstruct what has been damaged and what we have 
a capacity to reconstruct and pro provide compensation only in that cases when uh, reconstruction is not possible. Uh, the second one, uh, currently the primary focus is only on the conflict affected housing. Of course, we do understand that uh, the, 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 the compensation file is much more complicated and it, it, it includes a lot of the different uh, types of the property. However, the, it has been stated very clearly that the first focus on the housing and after the issue with the housing will be solved, solved we can think about the non-residential property, private assets, land plots, and so on. Uh, the, the third the third factor is a uh, cross-cutting digitalization agenda in Ukraine. Um, actually, the digitalization um, di digitalization activities of the Ukrainian government is one of the um, priority which has been stated by the by the by the Zelensky cabinet of ministers. So, what I mean practically that uh, any actions. Uh, for example, application for compensation, application that your housing has been damaged or destroyed uh, should be adjusted in a way that applicants should have a possibility to apply for them online uh, using their smartphones or using their laptops. Well, of course, there is still an option to do it in a person through administrative centers for providing of the governmental services, but any procedure uh, adopted by uh, Ukrainian government should be adjusted in a way to enable the online application. And the last one, a neutral, is uh, there is a significant need for the technical support. And I would like to, um, to pay particular focus to this because at this very moment, at this, at this particular day, some, some responsible person within the cabinet of ministers is working on the developing this compensation mechanism. And let's be honest, the, 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 the situation on the ground is quite complicated. We have a lot of different legal, uh, legal challenges connected with um, heavy bureaucracy in terms of the uh, property uh, ownership legislation. We have different situation of the uh, even presence of the ownership documentation in the rural areas. Uh, so in order to be able to develop the comprehensive uh, and accessible compensation mechanism, there is still a quite strong requirements from the government to support them in this development. And they are extremely open. I haven't been worked with any of the government who are open as Ukrainian one, and they provide, they open to, to any, any suggestion, any ideas. And this is quite an important thing during our work. The last one is negative, and also this is also important that we have to consider. The first one, uh, lack of data. And this is one of the most important challenge we have at this moment, because um, I would like to mention some of the figures we have at the moment, but um, give me a second, please. Uh, uh, so, the, the figures we have are quite fragment, uh, only fragmental. So, for example, in Ukraine, we have already established uh, the mechanism for conflict affected people to claim that their housing has been damaged or destroyed. It's not the application for compensation, it's just to claim to state that your housing has been affected by the conflict, and then it is tasked to the government to verify this information. So, at this moment, we have 135,000 application of the damaged or destroyed housing. And if you talk about figures on the square, it's uh, 9,400,000 square meters conflict affected housing. But also what is important to, 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 to say that it's based, on the, uh, it's based on the approach when people just state and these figures are not verified at this moment. Uh, the, another thing, another figures that we have that, for example, like it just in, in some part, part of Ukraine, in some, in some region, for example, in Kyiv region, we already have figures about like 5,000 residential building has been damaged and destroyed. And I mean, even the multi-storied houses, the house you've seen on the first slide, it's count just as a one. However, we understand the amount of the apartments are 
which are in this in this building. So the problem is that we don't have the consolidated data for Holy, for the for the Ukraine. But I know that some of the partners has been started working jointly with the shelter cluster on the consolidating the data, and also Ukrainian government making some actions in order to 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 have this data collection process more more streamlined in a one way in order to have the consolidated data further. Uh, the, 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 the second one is lack of coordination. Maybe it's a little bit strong wording, but the situation is now that we have some of the ministries which is responsible for different aspects of the compensation procedure. For example, we have Ministry of Reintegration, which is generally uh, responsible for overall integration of internally displaced people. However, we have the Ministry of Regional Development, which is overall responsible for the housing policy and for the any 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 regulations related with the construction, reconstruction, and so on. We also have the Ministry of Infrastructure, which is might be the the stake the main stakeholders in terms of the fund uh, for the reconstruction of Ukraine. So currently, in this moment, this coordination is only on the stage of being establishing. So uh, I hope this challenge will be addressed in the nearest future. But now, this is the situation we have on the ground. Uh, the next one is uh, lack of the clear concept how the restitution mechanism could, could look like. Uh, I will um, probably I will say a little bit more on this during the two next slides when I will explain what we have in place on the compensation initiative. However, the just few words as a spoiler that the compensation draft law it's more it's more framework kind of the law. And in order to be implemented, the exact the the by the the, the further bylaws should be adopted, uh, which uh, foresee how how exact the compensation mechanism will look like. And uh, the next one is of course lack of the access to some areas. Um, uh, at this very moment, we have been uh, we have a few areas of Ukraine, for example, like Kiev Oblast, Sumy Oblast, Oblast its region, uh, Kiev region, uh, Sumy region, Chernihiv Oblast, which is completely under the governmental control. And it is already an opportunity to start doing something in terms of the provision of the compensation restitution. However, uh, the, 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 the most affected areas south of Ukraine and, and east of Ukraine are still uh, under the Part of partially under the control of uh, Russian forces or de facto authorities in Donetsk and Luhansk Oblast, and there is now even access to assess the scope of the damages, not even talking about the provision of the compensation itself. And the last one, uh, ongoing hostilities in the south of Ukraine and the, and the east of Ukraine, we have uh, the new damages happen in, in daily basis because of the ongoing hostilities have quite severe nature, and it is another challenge for the government to address this issue, how they can provide any compensation mechanism in the areas when, when the new damages happen on a daily basis. Uh, then I would like to move forward to the, to the next slide about these few words about the compensation draft law. Uh, so um, what I would like to start with, um, as I would said, uh, as I said before, this this compensation draft law it it uh, it the direct uh, direct result of this state of the president of Ukraine that uh, every conflict affected people receive compensation or restitution. So one of the member of parliament of Ukraine has been initiated this this draft law, and currently they are in the process of preparing this draft law to the second hearing. So when we have the, so the situation which I'm going to briefly explain in the next couple of minutes why it might be a little bit changed in the next weeks or in the next months. Uh, the first uh, thing uh, I would like to start with that this draft law, it's only covered the conflict affected housing, uh, but they include the objects which was under the construction. In the, in, on the moment of um, uh, the, this war started. So uh, this draft law completely not covering uh, non-residential property and any other kind of the property. It's only for the housing. The next one, uh, they um, foresee that the potential beneficiaries is owners, 
uh, hires of the owners, investors in terms of the object and the construction. Uh, also, it's like some of the Ukrainian novel of the Ukrainian legislation, it's members of the housing co cooperatives. It's kind of like still in inheritance from the Soviet time. And owners, uh, owners association, if we talk about um, places which are shared in the multi-storied house. The next one, a responsible implementer will be settlements level local authorities. So on this level, uh, so the local authority will be completely responsible for the uh, for establishing the damage committee, uh, damage commissions, and also the uh, compensation commissions, which uh, will make the final decision who will receive compensation and the amount of this compensation. So everything will be on the level of the settlements level local authorities. However, it's still unclear who will be supervising this um this activity on the central level it's it's going to be all under the ministry of reintegration or ministry of regional development the next one it's probably the most tricky one it's uh from the text of the draft law is clearly understandable that uh the the, the, the government decided to have a strong evidence-based approach to decision making so practically it means that if you want if, if any person uh, want to receive the compensation, this person should prove the, the ownership to the conflict-affected house. And uh, of course, the, the base of the, and the, 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 the first step in order to receive the compensation is to ensure that you are legal owner of the house. The second uh, aspect of this evidence-based approach that um, in the, in the, the most uh, simple cases when there are only some windows broken, doors broken, roofing, um, uh, there is going to be no need to invite the special experts who have expertise on the construction. So it's going to be just under the decision of the local authorities. However, if your house are heavily destroyed, there is a need to invite uh, construction experts who can assess professionally the level of this level of damage and the cost of the of the and the cost of for its reconstruction because it will be directly related to the amount of the compensation. And the last uh, the, the 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 next one is uh, vulnerability criteria. Uh, the 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 law initiatives uh, said that uh, of course of, of course there is not going to be any discriminatory policy within uh, during the implementation. Uh, everyone, regardless of the state, uh, of the uh, age, uh, sex, uh, location, uh, social um, position, should have the equal rights to receive compensation. However, there is going to be a vulnerability criteria. So those people who are in the most vulnerable situation will receive the compensation first. And the last one is uh, transferring the claimant rights to Ukrainian government. So uh, in order to receive the compensation, um, there is a need to have separate contract with the government uh, under which the claimant for the compensation transferring any further claimant rights to the Russian Federation or to the de facto authorities to Ukrainian government. So if the person receives compensation under the Ukrainian law, there is no further rights to, to, to be a claimant in terms of the further potential court hearings with the Russian Federation. Uh, and the last probably, but definitely not the least, the, the compensation law for C3 ways of the three forms of the compensation. The first one is a financial compensation, it's just like money. The, the next one is a natural compensation when applicants will be provided with a new housing. And the last one is a reconstruction of co-owned property. I mean, this sharing, shared property within the multi-storied houses. So uh, the last slide, I just wanna say a few words about this, each of these forms. Uh, the first form is financial, financial compensation, technically just, just money. So it's only applicable for damaged houses. So if people, if any person, uh, they made one exception. If person has an individual private housing, which is destroyed, I mean, not an apartment, but just like 
the, the dwelling, the, the individual uh, housing, they also can apply for the financial compensation. And uh, there is going to be a spending limitation. So they consider it as a targeted assistance. So uh, it's still not clear which exactly the spending limitation will look like, but we expect that person who receive financial compensation might have a chance to spend it only for a new house. So, and the last one, amount, amount of the compensation, this amount of the compensation will, will be up, uh, determined upon uh, damage assessment. So how much will it cost to reconstruct the, ho the house? So this exact amount of money people should receive the compensation. But there is two more limitations. The first one, if the um, cost of reconstruction is actually higher than just to buy a new house, people will not receive the, the amount of this more than the cost of reconstruction. And the last one, uh, the amount of compensation could not be exceed that the market price of 150 square meters. Um, the next one is a natural compensation. It's quite also tricky and interesting one. Uh, so uh, by the natural uh, compensation, they means um, the construction of new houses with a further transfer in ownership rights to the applicants. So uh, this kind, this form of compensation will be applicable only for the completely destroyed houses. And um, what is also important that this new house, uh, housing uh, must be built in the same area, in the same settlements. Well, actually in the law, in the law it is written that in the best case scenario, the new house should be built even on the same land block. However, it is not practically possible. They allow to build in the same settlements, just nearby the, 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 the previous location. And the person applicants had the right to reject an offered object and independently choose another one. Even if some private company construct the new house, they can just choose it. And if, it, um, if the price of the new house meet the standards for the for this compensation procedure they have all the, the, the they have the right to do so uh, the another thing the new house in any case should be bigger could not be bigger than 150 square meters and the last one it's going to be limitation in order to the applicants uh, and and the people who receive new house will not have the right to sell this new housing for the next three years uh, the last one is co-owned property. I mean, this is just, you know, the, the, shared, um, the shared places in the multi-storied houses. So the concept is quite simple. They just want to fund the reconstruction through owners associations. And it's only applicable for the damaged and multi-storied residential buildings. So um, at this moment, uh, this is really, really briefly what we have in Ukraine in terms of the context overview and the currently existing legislation uh, legislation initiatives. But I would be really glad to answer any of the questions in the end of the meeting or it's it's up to you, Jim, to, to, to moderate it in a way you, you Thanks, must. Thanks, Vladimir. Yeah, no, thank you. That's really um, insightful, helpful, and a great overview of, of what the current situation is with the compensation law. I think. I mean, it's good to hear that there's some positives and some good things there, but also some challenges and um, really helpful for you to pick out some of those those uh, uh, key key parts there. Um, I'm going to hand over to John Unra now, who's going to uh, talk a little bit about some of the work he's been doing. And then, Flodomir, we'll come back to some questions once John's uh, introduced um, uh, what he's been working on as well. And, um, you know, that this is you know, part of an effort to uh, in, in this sort of real-time formulation of these, these policies, these laws, these practices, how can we see what else is going on around sort of international best practice for these things as well? And, and how can we um, sort of be part of that, that conversation as well? So, John, over to you. Thanks, Jim. Uh, appreciate it. And thank you, Vladimir, for your, uh, your leadership on this, this really important issue and your, your very uh, in-depth knowledge about uh, what's going on in, in Ukraine. Um, so maybe just to start things off, we could, we could talk a little bit about uh, uh, the last words that, that, that Jim just said, sort of um, a look internationally. And, uh, and what's kind of broadly seen in some cases as, as best practice or what's worked 
well elsewhere, and and how that might contribute to uh, to the Ukraine uh, situation. But in, in reading the the law and the associated materials, there's, there's also the the reverse. I, I see that a lot that is in the Ukraine law and, and that material contributes to international best practice as well, because a lot of it is very forward thinking and, and very, uh, very progressive. So it's, it's fantastic to, to see that. So, so what, what I would find exciting about this is to tap into the, the knowledge and experience of, of uh, everyone present here uh, in this idea of um, comparing best practice, uh, comparing what's worked well elsewhere, uh, comparing what the international donors might uh, expect uh, in, in terms of moving forward with uh, large-scale support of, of Ukraine in reconstruction and, and its compensation efforts, uh, including uh, where to get that fund, those, uh, those funding, and how to make things happen in a, in a fairly uh, timely uh, timely manner, uh, and 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 that and kind of bring that outside look and and kind of um, integrate it or or kind of compare it with what uh, Vladimir has just uh, talked about, um, and um, and and with some uh, the law itself. So um, uh, I think Jim distributed earlier that that law. I'm hoping the link uh, uh, works. I know there were some glitches there. Jim also uh, sent around a, a quick guidance note that some of us had, had put together uh, regarding some of the kind of the larger questions um, of uh, the international view versus Ukraine's uh, reality. So, so maybe just to, to, to start things off, um, I could just throw something out there and we can respond to that or we could uh, we could respond to other things as well. And, and to respond, if you could either wave your hand physically or better virtually put your hand up uh, so that we can uh, we can call on you. I, I know if you wave your hand virtually, I have to either remember that, whereas if you if you if you put it up uh, electronically, then then it's always there so we can get at that. So I'm not, uh, we got 55 people. I can't see everyone. So I'm going to have to page through my, with my view here and in order to find people. So I'll apologize if we don't go in the order of the raised hand. Um, so we'll see how adept I am at, at Zoom here. Um, so I guess one big issue that, that I have is that um, uh, we have approximately 12 million people, right? So uh, that are dislocated. So that's refugees plus uh, plus the internally uh, dislocated. Um, once we wind down the, the conflict, and I, I think most of us uh, would like it to go one way versus a, a, another, that 12 million is gonna all start to return. That, that 12 million is, is a lot of people. And it's a lot of people that's gonna hit this process more or less all at once. Uh, and so one question I have is that the some of the aspects of the law that require a case-by-case -case look at, at, at the applications, at the assessment of damage, the, um, the local uh, level uh, consideration of uh, each and every uh, application, verifying it, uh, defining how much compensation, et cetera. Um, some of the other aspects of the law which require if you don't have documents, you get assistance in trying to get those documents in order to file your claim. So I, I'm, I'm kind of concerned that this these numbers of returnees are gonna be quite overwhelming. And is there the capacity that, um, uh, does Ukraine have the capacity to, to handle all that? Uh, I think that there would be some agreement or maybe around the, uh, uh, the virtual room here that um, no, no country is actually able to do that. So, so you would get kind of the, the, the biggest superpower and they wouldn't handle these numbers coming into uh, to a, a claims uh, process. Um, and so you can tell the people, please be patient, uh, wait your turn. Uh, that waiting, of course, uh, can go on for years. Uh, and it, people actually don't, uh, don't wait for too long before they get really disgruntled. Uh, they have to be supported, they have to eat, they have to send their kids to school, they have to uh, drink water, they have to gain employment, they have to be secure. All of that costs huge money, right? So, so there's a cost. There's a human cost and an economic cost to having people wait their turn 
in a process that that seeks to go kind of uh, person by person. So I just thought I'd throw that out there and and uh, tap into some of the expertise in the room here and, and see if there's any uh, any thoughts on on that and if and uh, and where else we might want to uh, take the discussion. Igor. Still muted. Sorry for this. I'm just trying to unmute myself. I managed, right? You can hear me. Good. Okay, so first, thank you very much for inviting me. Nice to see so many uh, familiar faces here. John, great work. Vladimir, thank you very much for the for the very comprehensive update of where the things stand in, in Ukraine. Um, you know, I'm not going to use the word, the word unprecedented, uh, uh, but it is, and there is no question about that in terms of destruction, in terms of human rights violations, in terms of everything. So it's a, it's a really unique situation in a way that we have uh, massive destruction and massive human rights violations happening in the same time, but in the same time, a state who is more or less relatively ready, actually, more than the other states that we have seen in our work in other places, you know, ready actually to do something, you know, and there is a political will to do it. So that's good. So Volodymyr was dividing the things on positive and negative and neutral, you know, on the, on the, ne on the, ne on the negative side, I would say it's massive. On the positive side, I would say, you know, it is a state which has institutions which with a su sufficient, you know, upgrade and update and support might be actually able to process. The law itself, I had a very brief uh, uh, opportunity, you know, to quickly look through, go through it. It's not a bad law. From I mean, I have seen much more, more worse laws, so it doesn't. It's not a bad law, but there are some gaps which are already identified. One of the gaps is the yeah the mass claim processing. You know, it's you know the way it's envisaged now. It's not going to happen. Uh, this damage assessment that John mentioned on a case by case basis is going to be extend the process too long. It's going to spend a lot of resources. Uh, consume a lot of resources from the institutions in Ukraine. So maybe a simple way, way can be or should be should be found. The other thing about the law is that the envisage a creation of two new institutions the way I understand. These two new two institutions, the commission and the register, they do not exist at the moment. And and these need to be created from scratch. And and this is gonna be a, a, a really, really big work that needs to be done. And also the question is, you know, whether the law envisages sufficient uh, resources in terms of number of people, staff, and competencies for these institutions. We have seen in our work, John, myself, others who are here, you know, many commissions who consist of too few judicial personnel who are not actually capable to process 120,000 claims by themselves, you know, and they have zero support from a secretariat. So. It is not very clear. Perhaps it will be regulated by the bylaws, which was follow, which is good because it's, it's generic, so it could be modified by bylaws. But these bylaws basically should also provide that people who are making the decision, the commissioners, with sufficient information and sufficient support in terms of staff. So that's one of the critical things. And um, the challenge from human rights perspective would be the provision that they have to sign a contract, the claimants, with the state that they will not be able, they, they will not sue or maybe they will not pursue that claim anywhere else. That might be challenging, and we need to see whether what would be the response of the Venice Commissions or maybe some other institutions to the law, which will review the law. So it might be a human rights challenge over there. And the last thing that I'm going to mention is the vulnerability criteria. Uh, I think it needs to be expanded, I may perhaps maybe a bit more refined. Because many of those people they are, who are IDPs and refugees are in the same time victims of other human rights violations, not only loss of land and property, but some of them are victims of sexual violence. Many of them have lost their you know, families, et cetera. You know? So in terms of prioritization, you know, there has to be probably a better and more, more nuanced definition. And one last word, finally, I think this is very important and it's very good that it's convened because uh, uh, for a... Uh, quite some time we have been talking about the, the importance of, of, of the links between transitional justice and durable solutions. And, and this is very important because I think in Ukraine, it's actually the place where we will be able not only to see, but try, actually do, try to do some changes in terms of linking more the, the, the transitional justice sector and the durable solution, solution sector. So I will stop here. Thank you very much. And, and thank you for the good work, uh, everyone. Thank you.
Thanks, Igor. Uh, John, I don't hear you. Thank then, in you, case. Igor. Oh, there you are. Um, John, we see you, but I yeah, can't hear sorry, you. Sorry, glitches at my end. Uh, um, anybody else with a, with a comment? So I see two hands raised, and then there was a couple of comments in the chat as well. So maybe we could take the uh, the comments can with the hands raised. Can you hear and then me now? We could, just about. It's a little bit in and out. So maybe turn hello? your hello. Maybe turn your camera off, John. Um, I don't know if you can. How's that? Yeah, that's that's better. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. So yeah. Um, Okay, Legrand, did you have your hand up? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we oh, hear you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I'm with, uh, I'm a shelter, one of the shelter guys at uh, Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance. People may know me. Um, two, two questions. One, very interesting question was, was done. I mean, really good presentation, by the way. Um, this is really a, the financing of a shelter program, and it's going to take a long time, as everybody's indicated. So my first question is, how can the humanitarian shelter activities take place while the overarching bigger development and recovery activities are taking place under this law that you're talking about right now? Because it's going to be many, many, many years. I mean, our experience shows that it's three to five years before it's any kind of reasonable recovery and housing in these major uh, operations. And we seem to lose track of the humanitarian um, shelter activities, handshaking with the development activities. In other words, <clears throat> Uh, taking care of the humanitarian activities at a ground on the ground building up while the larger infrastructure processes from the top start building down and how those two meet. I'd be interested in how someone sees how we can coordinate those two issues. And the second question deals with quality of construction and how are we going to ha how are we going to guarantee good quality and how are we going to take care of the asbestos issue. I would suspect because it's all concrete um, Russian type construction, there's a large amount of asbestos that's going to be in the rubble. Over. Thank you. Um, yeah, good questions. I, I'm wondering if, um, uh, as these questions come in, if maybe sometimes, I mean, sometimes I, I'm thinking that maybe Vladimir or others can maybe have a response to the specific question so we can attend to those. Um, so, so for the last two questions with uh, uh, Igor and Legrand, um, anybody want to respond specifically to those maybe before we move on? Um, I, I would get yeah. mm -hmm. Vladimir. Sorry, sorry, yes, because I was thinking that this is a time to jump in. Uh, I would definitely can answer the second one about the building standards. And this is not going to be a big issue because uh, currently in Ukraine, we have this Ministry of Regional Development, who is re which is responsible for the, for the development of the comprehensive policy on the protection of the, of the, um, of the building construction and so on. So each of the building standards is quite updated from the recent times. And I think it's gonna be one of the pre-requirements during this reconstruction to ensure that the new construct, new houses will meet the standards under the Ukrainian law. Another thing, of course, it's gonna be how the shelter, uh, humanitarian shelter actors will coordinate with the Ukrainian stakeholders in order to also meet the Ukrainian standards, not only the international one, but I think this is something that is clearly manageable to do just when we have the facilitation of the shelter cluster and the, the government is quite open for this discussion. Thank you, Vladimir, uh, appreciate it. Um, let's see, any other hands up? So I see three hands. 
Next, John, I see Abire, okay. then Ryan, and then Max Moratti. So maybe we could take those and okay. then come back to those ones. Perfect. Jim, I'm not seeing those. Maybe if you could call sure. on those yeah, one yeah, I'll by keep one. an eye on those. And yeah, Ibere, do you want to okay. um, come in? Thanks. Um, yeah. So um, my question is um, just um, taking a step back and, and reflecting a bit on, on what we're discussing. And, and I think that it seems that we, we are discussing an issue of reconstruction, um, of post-war reconstruction, and we're not discussing necessarily an issue of property restitution, uh, which is traditionally the issue that um, that triggers the the development of this type of um, compensation and, and restitution commissions, like we've seen in in Colombia or in in, in Kosovo, Bosnia. Um, it's completely different um, um, uh, phenomena that we're looking at in Ukraine. We're talking about reconstruction. So, um, and I think that framing it as compensation brings um, a more difficulty to the process because that means that we need to do proper damage assessment um, of each of the properties that have been damaged and, and, um, and, and then um, um, tailor the compensation uh, to the damage, et cetera. And this reconstruction is not going to be um, done this way. Uh, and we all know that even doing just the, rest of the, property, the property restitution um, is, is very difficult to do with a commission. Imagine doing the reconstruction on top of that. It's not going to happen. This reconstruction is going to be self-driven, owner-driven. So I think that when we're talking about reconstruction, we should be talking about um, how to remove obstacles for market forces to work, uh, to provide resources for the people that don't have resources to uh, reconstruct it themselves, and so, for, so on and so forth. So I think that um, yeah, so I, my, my question is just, you know, why frame it as, as compensation and not just as, as reconstruction? I would be glad to answer, if may I? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, it, it's it's a tricky question, and let's be honest, I, I, I will try to, 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 to explain why, why, we, why we use this terminology, of course. First of all, we do understand that the, even the compensation, the financial compensation, of course, is a part of the restitution of violated property rights itself, the general umbrella. However, in Ukraine, the, the, the stakeholders use restitution in two different meanings. The first one, when we call, well, what we're talking about, like the restitution of the, of the property, it's... Uh, well, the first one is restitution of the property. When they just build a new house, give it, provide it to the applicants, and in this way, restitute the violated rights. So they call it like restitution of the property. However, we do understand that there is like restitution of the rights, which is mostly taking place in, 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 if we have such issues as a secondary occupation and so on. Currently, this restitution of the rights which is most usually, most commonly used in the international community. It's not a, a thing here in Ukraine. We mostly talk about the restitution of property. And uh, the thing is why they frame the provision of restitution of the property as a part of the compensation. Of course, the question of the, to the, to the government, but um, let's be, uh, let's be honest on this point. I don't think that at this very moment they wouldn't consider the rewarding of the word of restitution to compensation and so on as the first priority. So we can point their attention that you can reframe it in a different way. But if it works for them, okay, we can understand that under Ukrainian legislation, there are like two, two types of this restitution. Thanks. Um, John, I'm seeing there's two more hands raised and I was just thinking in the interest of time, if we take those two questions and have a response and then we'll probably need to move on to the other uh, items on the agenda. Um, but then, you know, but this is the start of a conversation, but maybe yeah, if we can hear from uh, uh, Ryan and then, or oh, Laura's just crept in there. Good work, Laura. Ryan, Max Moratti, and then we'll go to Laura and then we'll, yeah, if that's okay, we'll then have a response and then tie this, this part together. Um, Ryan, do you want to come in? 
Yeah, um, thanks, Jim. So I just have a quick comment and then a question was that and while we're also talking about the longer the time period for um, let's say housing compensation and everything, we also need to factor in um, cl the cluster munitions and the mines that have been uh, present both in the and rural areas and the demining action in itself uh, elongates the time for one evaluation of the mines present in these areas and then the demining process and the post demining evaluation itself. And um, this obviously affects in urban areas the quality of construction that is undertaken in these spaces, but in the rural areas, especially when they're in agriculture and farmland areas, um, that actually had in, the, in previous instances has, has caused people to move towards urban settlements in the first place, which in itself creates more um, housing stresses in urban setups altogether, which obviously compounds on the situation in these cities. Um, the question that I had was, um, I haven't read the law that um, you guys posted the link of in the chat, but I had a question that once the refugees start on the Ukraine territories, there is an interim period before the case is considered, and actually as a result given where they return to their but true housing, land, and property, where they where they basically were settled before the war. Um, have there any measures been placed in regards to avoid ghettoization or development of informal slums during the consideration of the cases altogether? Uh, because looking at past cases in Afghanistan and India, even though those were in the case of IDPs, that uh, when cases took years to be considered the familial setups, especially when children had to go to schools, inevitably led them to settle in informal slums just so they could access uh, a public school that is relatively cheap to so, again, it's like a generational thing and the generational mobility aspect. Thanks, Ryan, good question. Um, so we'll take the questions, comments from Max Moratti um, and then Laura, and then we'll come back to Vladimir. I think John might have dropped off, so. Um, it's good that we're recording this so he can catch up. Oh, he's back. Oh, I'm he back. Is. He is back. He is back. <laughs> Thanks, Kurt. Um, okay, Max Moratti, please come in. Yes, thank you, Jim. Yeah, Massimo, Max Moratti is my user. Oh, sorry. I'll correct that. No worries. Um, I have three questions. Um, three questions, I think, for, for Vladimir, but also building on what the, the other colleagues has, has mentioned. Because I work on the, in 2016, 2017, I was part of the consultations with the Council of Europe for the law that provided compensation for IDPs from Donbass. So I would be happy to hear from Volodymyr if there has been any, what is the status of implementation of those laws and if there might be a conflict between the displacement over displacement. This is the first question. Um, the second one, and also thinking of what Igor was saying a few moments ago, I mean, I know that those entitled to compensation are also investors. And to some extent, they're also, we're also talking about legal persons in some aspect, no? um, associations of owners, something like that, but also people who finance and invest it. So I was wondering if we have to make priorities, shouldn't we add the status of IDP as a person who has lost their property rather than people who have simply invested in a future uh, properties that have not been completed? And the third question, I mean, thinking also about, um, you know, potential uh, minority groups and I'm thinking about the Roma, I mean, I'm not clear if the law foresees the possibility for asking for compensation for informal settlements. So properties that were not, uh, you know, formally registered and where there was, was a bit of an irregular situation and so on. And so these are like three questions and we yeah, finally would agree. I mean, the task is really massive. There is, you know, we're talking about millions of people, but again, I see, as you know, it was mentioned previously, this is more an issue of, let's say, uh, yeah, compensation and reconstruction rather than dealing with secondary occupation and secondary occupants. You know, at the moment, this is not uh, an, an issue. Thank you. Thanks, Maximo. Um, Laura, do you want to come in and, uh, then we'll give a, a final word to Vladimir and John and then gather these questions and use them to uh, help us uh, guide and develop another session on this in the future. Laura, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. And uh, many thanks to Vladimir and our colleagues on the ground for the very useful presentation. I, I actually wanted to also ask about uh, minorities and vulnerable group. And I also wanted to hear if there is any specific provision 
vis-a-vis uh, -vis women and access to compensation and restitution for women, given also uh, that we know in the refugee response and IDP response, there are uh, quite a lot of uh, now women who are becoming head of household. And then I also really wanted to share some of the experience from, from Syria. I'm currently still uh, working on the Syrian response and HLP, uh, uh, and we are very far in Syria from even having a draft law on potential HLP restitution and compensation, and we are you know, more than 11 years now into the conflict, uh, but we are still trying uh, to prioritize activities that are uh, key in you know, advancing uh, um, a potential HLP mechanism, uh, if and when this mechanism will be established for Syria, because I think uh, the situation is different. But I think one, two important lessons learned from, from the Syrian response, if it can be any, you know, inspiration for, for our colleagues working in Ukraine, is the importance of including and continue to advocate for including HLP language in a potential uh, peace framework you know, uh, agreement uh, of some sort that can be uh, uh, the result of a political process. I think this is a key uh, point that we are in NRC here continuing to advocate. But then we are also working to uh, really enhance the capacity of profession, including lawyers, but other professionals that will be key for, you know, facilitating some of this, this scheme that is envisioned uh, in the draft law. And I think uh, Professor John Uro said it very well, no country can do this on their own. And clearly any, uh, um, you know, profession, uh, in, including lawyers in, in Ukraine will be, or engineer will be really overwhelmed uh, if and when the time comes for, you know, uh, uh, putting in practice and implementing what the law uh, sets out. And then really the importance of uh, carrying out uh, information, counseling, legal assistance, really raising awareness with the displaced population on uh, HLP documentation and preserving HLP documentation. Again, one of the major lessons learned here from the serial response is that uh, many refugees and IDP unfortunately have lost their document. And so with the loss uh, of these uh, and the lack of this documentation, of course, uh, we know that their uh, rights are weaker and their uh, position, if and when a restitution mechanism will be put in place, will be weaker. So uh, these were some of the some of the lessons learned and some of the work that we are doing uh, as part of this response. Thank you very much. Thanks, Laura. Uh, good to hear from you. Um, and there's other questions in the chat as well. And I think the richness of the comments and the questions show what a, 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 well, a, you know, a necessary and really uh, interesting area this is. Um, John, um, Vladimir, let's let's pass over to you for a couple of uh, final comments, and then um, and then I think, uh, yeah, as I said, I think what we can do is John's agreed to um, sort of help um, sort of draw together a group to look at this sort of area in more detail, and we can have a more dedicated uh, time to this because I think there's such a rich area of discussion and. Um, and also some like you know genuine pulling together the experience of this group is invaluable so um yeah vladimir john a final comment and then we'll uh, move on to uh, the next the next items thanks uh okay um uh, great thanks jim thanks uh everybody for uh, your really insightful comments appreciate it um so so lots going on um i guess one um the one thought I might have is kind of the, the, the broad context and direction of our of our discussion, and maybe Vladimir can uh, can comment on this. So the draft law is in the uh, first reading of Parliament. It, it's it's gone through that. There there are two more. Um, I guess I'm wondering if um, a, a, a subset of of the group here wants to proceed forward with our discussions and. Um, Come up with maybe a, um, a, a, a small, tightly worded uh, contribution. Um, would we be able to submit that to Parliament for consideration? Um, and so, in, in such a contribution, we might uh, have, for example, other cases similar to what Ukraine is experiencing and, and, and how that how that went. So, in other words, provide some background material for consideration to. Uh, to Parliament, might we have uh, the opportunity to uh, to do that as a as kind of a, a goal of these these discussions? So so I'll end that with that question to Vladimir. Thanks. 
Um, okay, okay, Alex, let me start like really briefly answering the question that I managed to catch. Uh, the first one, I will start with the last one about the prioritization of any particular vulnerable groups and any groups which require some uh, special protection measures. The first one, the draft law prescribes directly priority for uh, family with, uh, with uh, uh, many children. The second one, uh, children. The second one, people with disability, and the last one, uh, ex-combatants. Uh, what about uh, protection of uh, women and another um, categories of applicants? It just have non-discriminatory provision, which say that the comp access to compensation should be regardless of any of the. Uh, uh, status of gender, age, as I said, gender, uh, age, location, and, and so on. So this is about first question. The next one is about um, informal settlements. No, at this very moment, and it used to be practice, which we have a few years ago, and we have compensation mechanism for the bus area, Nesk and Hansk Oblast, only officially, formally with uh, objects of residential property uh, will be covered by the compensation. However, uh, the, the opportunity for the advocacy work is to simplify registration process for informal settlements as much as possible in order to provide residents of such settlements also to receive the access to the compensation. Uh, and I think this is something which is not really negotiable with the government about provision for the informal settlements without any registration. The next one is the, about priority for investors. Very good point. And this is something that I would definitely would voice for the government. And the last one is the conflict between two uh, procedures, the, which was existed before, which we are currently working. This is not going to be a place because it was geographical limitation on the Donetsk and Luhansk Oblast. And I really think that in the end, in the very ending, part of the bylaw, it will be a new uh, provision which say that the previous uh, compensation mechanism is not in place anymore. I think this is everything I catch, but if not, I would be glad to answer someone later. Yeah. Thanks, Vladimir. Um, yeah, trying to answer those questions in 30 seconds is not a, an easy task, um, but yeah, very much appreciated. So I think, um, I mean, there's yeah some really good questions there, and it strikes me that Whilst there might be room for us to be making recommendations and drawing on um, other best practice and other experience, it might also be that there's some advocacy points in there that we want to, to push forward as well, depending if, um, and that might be a separate process to something that we would uh, submit as well. So um, that's uh, be interesting to think about that and talk more. Um, yeah, thanks so much, everyone, for that, that part of our discussion. I think that was really rich. We, we can gather all those questions because I think they're part of formulating some of the areas that need further consideration and John's point there about you know if you would like to be part of a you know maybe a, a smaller group or a focus group on this then either put your name in the chat here or email me or John or Vladimir or whoever's contact details you have and and we'll do another kind of call out for this as well based on the mailing list but I I know that the mailing list sometimes you know gets spam filtered and all the rest of it so just want to give you the opportunity to register interests here. Um, great. Well, thank you. Um, now let's move. I think because we have about 25 minutes left um, of our scheduled time, let's go to um, just sort of open it up for people to give very brief sort of one minute, two minute update on what they're working on. Um, and this can be it might be that you're part of a humanitarian operation and want to share what you've been doing on HLP. It might be a particular challenge you're facing. Uh, it might be something else that you're developing, but just a, uh, a chance to open up and um, yeah, share, share what's going on. And we'll do that for uh, uh, a while <laughs> and then come back to a couple of things uh, just towards the end. Um, but yeah, let's uh, open up. Daniel, I see you had your hand raised, um, which I think came up at the end of the Ukraine conversation. Did you want to give an update on anything else? You're muted, so we can't hear you just yet. Yeah. yeah, thanks so much. I wanted to ask a question about the Ukrainian, Ukrainian issue, but as the time has already passed, let me give uh, some few uh, elements regarding the situation in Burkina Faso. Um, on the legal issues, uh, a process 
to, uh, uh, to domesticate the Kampala Convention started last uh, in 2020 in Burkina Faso. Uh, with the support of UN Asia and um, uh, some international organization. And because of the military coup, the, this process to uh, transpose this, the, the, the original law into domestic, into domestic, domestic uh, legal framework uh, is somehow stopped. But the issue is that uh, what I observed that the international community, humanitarian community is reluctant to, to advocate the, the new authorities in order to uh, make progress on this domestication process. Um, yeah, I, this is the situation that's going on here. And uh, regarding the HFP trends, uh, the situation is critical with mass displacement that is putting much pressure on uh, the housing, land, and property issues across the country. Today, 10 out of 13 regions are impacted and affected by the conflict. So this situation um, raise uh, questions and needs about HLP. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. That's 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 great. And and um, yeah, on that domestication of Kampala, I know a number of other colleagues are probably working on similar issues or facing that exact challenge. Um, do let us know in the chat if that's something you've worked on, or, or if you might be able to offer any idea um, as to that might assist Daniel. Um, and that's something we can maybe come back to another time as well. Thanks, Daniel. Would anyone else like to um, give a, a short update on their? their work, their operation, or their, uh, their things that they're working on. You're very quiet. I've exhausted all your energy on the Ukraine discussion. Fatih, yeah, please come in. Hi, Jim. Hi, Hi how are you? Afternoon and morning and evening. Fatigal, um, I'm from UN Habitat's GLTN. So just wanted to jump in with a quick update. Um, I think quite a few of you guys were part of our last um, launch on the Women, Land, and Peace messages, um, which was quite a successful launch. We've decided to move forward and actually create video animations on that content to kind of make it more accessible and share it widely um, through our network. So we're hoping um, to have that finished by the end of the summer and uh, in September, bring you guys all maybe back together to do a bit of like a validation session and see how that video is progressing. Um, in addition to that, some of our work from the field, we've developed a training guide on advancing women's land and property rights um, and it was adapted for the Somalia region and um, we're actually getting ready to launch that as well and so we wanted to have another webinar bring together some experts and so if anyone here is interested in participating um, I think I'll try to get help from Jim to kind of curate some of the the email lists for that we're hoping to do that early July um, to share the contents of that training guide um, to kind of also go over the process and why we thought it was important and maybe um, if any of the colleagues are interested in adapting similar training guides for their country contacts. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll end there. Thank you guys. Thanks so much Fatih. Um, uh, yeah, good to hear from you and I'm guessing there will be people who definitely will be interested in that, uh, that, that um, training that's been developed and yeah, we look forward to learning more about that. But yeah, very much happy to be, uh, uh, yeah, help convene that, that process. Um, anyone else want to update? You actually, whilst you're all thinking about whether or not you want to take that momentous leap and share something, um, we've got Ibire is going to give us a, a short update on, yeah, from his work with the Shelter Cluster on HLP uh, that that we collaborate on a lot. So Ibire, over to you. Uh, thanks, Jim. Uh, I'll try to make this uh, very short. Um, so um, I just want to share with you um, a bit of the work that we've been, been doing. Uh, so we're working on a, an online training on HLP. It's going to be focused on displacement crisis and 
um, mostly for CCCM and shelter practitioners, but of course that will benefit everyone. It's going to be an open course, and um, the idea is to have um, to have a course that is is you know more, more engaging and and, uh, and hopefully people will want to to do it and, and go through it. Um, so I'm going to put online the content that uh, we've been developing for the course and. I would you know, be ha very happy if, if you had some contributions or some comments on the content. These are the five modules that uh, are gonna be featured in the, in the trainings. It's most, the, the core of it is just uh, two, three, and four, which is security of tenure, uh, theory, practice, and then returns and, and property restitution. Uh, and the idea is to have, it's to do that in a gamified way. So um, to in, for the training to be based, to have a core, um, based on an interact, interactive video, where people are gonna be like first person and then uh, um, have uh, different branching stories according to the decisions that you make, because often that's the, the um, uh, conundrum that, that we find ourselves in when you're doing HRP, you have to figure out what, what you're going to do first, what you're going to consult, if you're gonna spend a lot of time checking land registry or um, talking to the different government authorities, or if you're gonna go on the ground and talk to the neighbors, et cetera. And you know that consumes time and resources. So try to um, play with those um, different different uh, constraints. Um, so yeah, so I'll, I'll share later on the link for the online documents so that people can can uh, comment on. And then um, who uh, whoever wants to participate in this designing of this training will be will be great. Thank you. Thanks, Ibire, um for that. Yeah, that would be great to to see that and to. Uh... Uh, yeah, to get some contributions and, and uh, yeah, really make that as engaging as as we as we can. Um, yeah, look forward to to that. And you mentioned um, yeah, that being sort of primarily for shelter CCCM, but of course open to everyone. Um, so I'll mention a couple of updates uh, from the global side um, that relate to I think yeah the last two two uh, uh, commenters. Um, so. I'm going to be attending the CCCM um, clusters annual meeting uh, next week, actually. Um, and myself and Nibiria are hosting a session on HLP. And we're, we're going to share kind of case studies around some challenges and responses. Um, so just wondering if there's anybody here who has worked with CCCM colleagues, so camp coordination, camp management colleagues on HLP issues, or if you've observed issues in a particular context, and we do, look, Marco's there, he's put his camera on so I can see the CCCM background, there we go. Um, but if you had suggestions of, of case studies for that, it'd be great to, to understand that a little bit more, like where some key ones are. So um, I, I was in South Sudan last week, so I was speaking to some colleagues there, so I think we're, we're going to share some of their examples uh, as there were some particular challenges that they're facing. Uh, but, but it'd be really good to, to hear others as well. Um, so yeah, we can either put, put those in the comment or get in touch with me on the, uh, on, on, on the old email. Uh, second comment, just to mention, I can't recall if I've said this before or not, but um, so at the moment, the HLP AOR is, is coordinated um, by NRC as the, the lead agency on that. And um, UN Habitat are going to uh, join as a co-coordinator in the coming months and there's just to let you know that's an ongoing process and um hope to have someone here who's going to speak a little bit about that but um in the end they couldn't make it so next time we're going to have a bit more of a an update on that but i wanted to let you know just because you know it'll probably be start getting discussed and you might start seeing things so just to let you know that um so you and habitat are going to be uh co-coordinating on on the global level with the aor um relating to Firstly, just want to say these meetings, if you have an area of interest and a subject you would like to have a focus on, then please do let me know. It'd be great to have presentations from either a particular country or on a theme and then a discussion around that. So that's firstly something to, uh, to, to have a think about. And uh, related to that is we have our newsletter, the sort of global update that goes out. And it'd be great also if you have things that you want to share about, if you've got things uh, to put, put out there, uh, it could be events, it could be uh, uh, reports, learning, it could be a, a short thing, a long thing, a blog post, anything. If, if there's things that you would like us to share to the whole of the, the mailing list, which is about 600 um, at the moment, um, then let me know and it'd be really good to, to include those. Um, also, the GPC, Global Protection Cluster, is launching its 
version, is it 2.0 or 3.0? It might be 5.0 by now, I'm not sure, but of its website. And so we've put together, um, so we're having a look again at the text for that. And again, if you'd be interested in being part of a small team that has a quick look at that and uh, make sure it's fit for purpose, then, then please let me know either in the chat here or by email. Um, I'll have a few of you that I will uh, call on as well to, to look at that. But if that's something you'd be interested in, so thinking about that very basic level, how do we communicate what the HLP AOR is about? then please, um, yeah, let me know. Um, the other side from the global side is that we just started the process to recruit um, an HLP information management um, and coordination uh, support person. So that's going to be about two kind of main roles. There's going to be support to um, managing information data. How do we use it to facilitate more effective HLP coordination response, but also around advocacy and resource mobilization. How do we tell better stories about what we're working on? How do we have real kind of data uh, driven sort of stories that, that will really help us communicate better about what works going on? So we're starting the recruitment for that. And we need that role also to be someone who can work in French as well as English, because we're also going to include some uh, support on behalf of the AOR to the Francophone uh, countries as well. So if you know people or if you are that person, please let me know. And it'd be great to, uh, yeah, to, to share the, the, uh, the process once, once that's online. Um, so, yeah, that's something that's coming up in the, in the next uh, few weeks and months. And final point for me is I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Ryan, who's going to give us an update on a recent um, event that we co-hosted that is also part of a, a bigger project that the AOR is working on. Ryan, over to you. Uh, thanks, Jim. Just let me get the presentation ready. Um, yeah. Right. Um, so as Jim had mentioned, we we hosted an event at the HNPW um, this year in Geneva on climate change, uh, disaster displacement, and housing, land, and property. The intersectionalities, intersectionalities between the three elements, um, which actually revealed a fair bit of overlap between what we are seeing now and how there are different agencies working on these thematics within their own mandates. But there's a lot of gaps that exist in terms of both the data collection, implementation, as well as um, consideration of what we see as emergency uh, services, as well as durable solutions. So in terms of what uh, inspired one the event and the larger project altogether is that uh, the NRC, as well as uh, uh, but under the, the Global Protection Cluster has seen that there's a significant overlap between um, climate displacement and long-standing HLP issues, which are also overlapped with um, ongoing conflict um, circumstances pre prevalent in certain uh, national scenarios, as well as um, access to natural resources and um, restriction of livelihoods, putting let's say agriculture, education, or even vocational activities. So um, this year, the NRC had applied for a grant with the government of Liechtenstein, which we received to address this knowledge gap and the inter intersectionalities between climate change, displacement, and HLP. And uh, in collaboration with the Global Protection and the HLP AOR, we have uh, worked towards one, assessing where these gaps exist, as well as trying to fill in these gaps, both through primary and secondary research, initiatives, conferences, and events that sort of consolidate what we need to look at moving forward as the effects of climate change uh, accentuate and exacerbate in different national contexts. So the three case studies that we'd seen in uh, during the event were from Mozambique, Somalia, and uh, from the Pacific. From the Mozambique, we saw that uh, the intensity and the rising frequency of cyclones that keep our washing on the African state has uh, one exacerbated the conflicts associated with um, with resource crunches, um, forced migration, as well as uh, housing insecurity. One of the major uh, issues that we've seen with uh, HLP in that natural context was the last uh, the loss of uh, documentation that is very critical to land rights, and therefore return of restitution became very very difficult. Um, due to national laws prevailing there. And currently, as 
what we have seen from the spokesperson in Mozambique is that by laws are being adapted to sort of uh, configure these, uh, these circumstances, the process is still underway. Something that was of critical importance was the gender and children aspect, which we saw that because of the structures present in terms of land ownership in, that, uh, in the country, familial setups force uh, male representation in terms of land ownership, therefore discriminatory customs uh, and patriarchal notions of who can own land and who can, who can this land be returned to uh, inhibit uh, access for women who may have who may be separated, divorced, or may have been uh, may, may be just may just be bachelors looking to turn to their um, uh, a land of origin or find new forms of settlement after displacement. Um, in this picture, you can see that uh, the the desperate need to find uh, documentation to show to bureaucratic offices goes on to lead to significant one waiting times, and furthermore. Um, lead to a lot of confusion and a lot of distress already in times where uh, there are more overlapping issues of, let's say, uh, conflict displacement, familial se separation, even gender insecurity. Now, in the case of Somalia, what we've seen is that uh, similar thematics in terms of loss of tenure do documents, as well as um, in term, uh, multipliers of conflict, but uh, an element that was uh, unique to the case of Somalia was the food security issue that uh, the coordinator in Somalia identified was that because of increasing food insecurity and the lack of um, agricultural produce as well as lack of access to uh, rural vocation, it has led to people to move towards uh, urban settlements and create informal settlements around uh, urban, urban settlements altogether which has led to one an increased uh, dependence on, on these settlements and increased the burden in these places as well. And has also led to severe secondary displacements in terms in times of extreme weather events and environment, environmental hazards. Um, which leads me to the, to the last case study was in the Pacific. Now the Pacific was, uh, at least what we, what we observed was a completely unique set of circumstances where ancestral land were essentially isolated to specific islands. And because of shrinking coastline inundation or increased salination, these communities are moving to new lands and it's led to intercommunal tension because of that migration. And furthermore, because of this tension or just entirely because of uh, coastal displacement, uh, the urban hotspots turned, uh, started to have informal settlements being set up around docks or on the outer rings of these settlements, which are often close to coastal areas for access to fishing or um, access to uh, coastal-based activities, which includes uh, inter-island boating and et cetera. Now, because of this, it goes on to show that while these countries are working towards uh, creating co a compensatory or uh, response frameworks to climate displacement, HRP is often seen as a long-term or a middle-term issue. And it's been sidelined as something that, that, that will be addressed later on. But what we have witnessed is that HRP is actually central to a lot of the issues that they're facing because the lack of housing security reasons, uh, leads to risk of trafficking, gender uh, violence, as well as loss of vocation, um, lack, of lack of access to education, as well as discriminatory practices such as uh, uh, indiscriminate rent, indiscriminate rent pricing, as well as uh, forced homelessness. Um, so in the interest of ensuring that there's maximum access to the outputs of the Lixigen project, the NRC has set up a mailing list where you can sign up to receive uh, regular publications that, that's coming out from other collaborative organizations, and as well as the events and any other material that we will be preparing uh, during the duration of this project. You can scan that QR code and uh, just follow the, the uh, just follow the form, and uh, yeah, thank you so much. And back to you, Jim. Thanks so much, Ryan. And I realise in my haste, I didn't introduce you properly. So Ryan is working with the NRC in Geneva as an intern on policy and partnerships, and he's got a real interest and background in HLP, particularly in areas related to climate as well. So um, it's been great having Ryan working with us, and he's working with us on this 
uh, this project. So there's going to be a briefing based on that event as well that will be available very shortly. And I put links in to watch the uh, event again um, on YouTube if you would like to, to do that. And um, yeah, thank you. So um, does anyone else have any uh, last updates? We have a few minutes left and um, anyone else like to, to come in? There's some great stuff in the chat in case you haven't been uh, been looking yet. So I'd recommend it as a great place to hang out. Um, I will give just a couple of minutes on, I just got back yesterday from South Sudan um, where I was there for about a week or so with, um, yeah, to, to meet uh, colleagues working on HLP and also as part of the Global Protection Cluster had a, a, a mission there to support the cluster. And HLP issues are everywhere in South Sudan, as I don't know if you know that or not, but they really are kind of a real underlying part of many of the challenges that have been faced. And um, I was able to see lots of you know, work, good work going into improve people's security of tenure, but there was a real obvious need to link that to other types of support around shelter livelihoods and a real need for that integrated approach. Also linked to uh, uh, work that's being done, but needed more of on access to justice, rule of law, those kind of things. And um, yeah, there was a real case of th these things really being joined up. And I'll give a much more detailed uh, presentation uh, next time. And maybe actually while we're here, I'll ask the um, South Sudan colleagues to join me in that. So next meeting, we can do something together maybe on that. Um, another part of the, the visit there was to, um, um, yeah, has led to us kind of, I suppose, elevating the HLP coordination a little bit there. So we're activating a an HLP um, AOR that um, NRC are going to lead, and that's going to be happening. Uh, the process has begun, uh, just sort of developing TOR and that will bring a little bit more visibility and create a bit of a, a, yeah, a wider forum open to dealing with those issues. And it was interesting because I spoke to colleagues working on GBV, CCCM, shelter, mine action, access to justice, rule of law, um, women's access to land. Uh, all of them saying that HLP is, is needed to be thought about and is a much more integrated approach. And interestingly, the new Madden coordinator, or relatively new, I think she's been there six months, uh, convened a protection round table, which was the, the first time I think that had been done in the country. And it brought together a lot of different actors working from across the you know, humanitarian peace and development um, nexus. Um, and it was really clear how much HLP issues cut across. So it could be a really interesting place to look at how we do that more integrated uh, uh, programming. Um, let's hope some people have the courage to do that. Um, but yes, we'll talk more on that next time. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think we might finish two minutes early unless anyone has a comment or a uh, question or totally fine if you don't uh, and let's do one last cameras on and have a wave if you're still here um, and uh, thanks so much for joining thanks uh, Vladimir John thanks for other other contributors and presenters and um, yeah look forward to seeing you all next time <laughs> cheers thanks everybody thanks everyone thanks bye you. everybody thanks everyone thanks Jim